As everybody knows, I think she just told you, I'm Pastor Mike's daughter. I'm Stephanie Yeager. And today, um, I chose a topic, and I kept on asking God, is this really the, what you wanted me to talk about? And then the one night, Joanna's husband, Randy, all of a sudden just stood up and said, why isn't God answering our prayers? There's way too many reasons for me to talk about. And that was what I was writing about. And then he stood up another week or two late, later, and he mentioned again. And even Mom said, that was out of left field. So I believe God confirmed to my heart that he wants me to talk about why God isn't our answering our prayers. But before I launch into the message that he's given me, let's bow our heads in prayer and pray. God, I just ask you to set a watch before my mouth and keep the door on my lips. Let the words I teach today be true and let them reach people for you. Use me to bring you glory and to set the captives free. And I thank you, Lord, for softening people's hearts and for revealing if anything I say tonight does not completely line up with your word. Enable me, enable people, help us, Father God, and give me boldness to proclaim your word. And help us, Father God, to follow through with what we hear and to be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving ourselves. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Why isn't God answering my prayers? Why isn't he moving on my behalf? Many of us are asking these questions. We want to know, why isn't God answering us? Here we are, we're calling to God in desperation, we're asking, we're seeking, we're trying to get an answer, and yet it seems, to all appearances, like nothing is happening. And today, I want to answer that question for you. There are many reasons, and there could be things that I miss, but in my study of the Bible, there are ten major reasons that I found why God may not be answering our prayers. The first and foremost is a lack of holiness in our everyday lives. If we want him to answer our prayers, we have to be holy as he is holy. He says, be thou holy as I am holy. In fact, if we freely embrace that which he considers evil, his ears are closed to our prayers. In 1 Peter 3.12 it says, For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous. And his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. And Second Chronicles 16.9 says, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on the behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. God looks to answer and help people whose hearts are perfect towards him. People who are walking in righteousness and holiness. If you're not walking in holiness, automatically his ears are closed to your prayers. In God's eyes, according to Mark 7, 20 to 23, evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, which means inclined to lustfulness, an evil eye, blasphemy, Pride and foolishness are evil things that come from within and defile the man. Automatically, if your actions, your words, your thoughts, your deeds are evil, then the face of the Lord is against you and his ears are closed to your prayers. First, make sure you're not actively engaged in evil. David was a man after God's own heart, and this was his cry every day. He said in Psalm 19, 12 to 13, Who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright, and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. And in Psalm 143, 10, he says, Teach me to do thy will, for thou art my God. Thy spirit is good. Lead me into the land of uprightness. Every day I ask God, cleanse me from secret faults. Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Lead me into the land of uprightness, Father God. And you know what? This needs to be our heart's prayer. This needs to be our cry every day because in our own pride, in our own lack of sight, we cannot see all the faults we have. Many of us presume that we're innocent and we're blameless. If we go to God and say, God, show me my secret faults, he will show you. 
Now, if you repent of your sins, He is faithful and just to forgive you. It says in 1 John 1, 9, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But God will forgive you, but you need to watch out for something, unforgiveness. Because if you don't forgive, God will not forgive you. Which brings us to our second reason that God may not be answering your prayers. The first being a lack of holiness, and the second is unforgiveness in your heart. And you know what? That may be the answer that you cannot get through to Jesus and have him answer you. In Matthew 6, 14 to 15, it says, For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. And the next one is Mark 11, 25 to 26. And when ye stand praying, Forgive if ye have aught against any, that your Father also which is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. But if ye do not forgive, neither will your Father which is in heaven forgive your trespasses. God hates unforgiveness and automatically if you don't forgive, you're going to be in trouble with Christ. In Matthew 18, 21 to 35, we read the parable of the man who owed the king money. Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me, and I forgive him? Till seven times? Jesus saith unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king, which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him, which owed him 10,000 talents. Before as much as he had not to pay, the Lord commanded him to be sold, and his wife, and his children, and all that he had in payment to be made. The servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion, and loosed him, and forgave him the debt. But the same servant went out, and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him an hundred pence. And he laid hands on him, and he took him by the throat, saying, Pay me what thou owest. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet, and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. And he would not. But he went and cast him into prison, till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry, and they came and told unto their Lord all that was done. Then his Lord, after that he had called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt, because thou desirest me. Shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? And his Lord was wroth, and delivered him to the tormentors, till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if you from your hearts do not forgive every one his brother their trespasses. As you can see in the story, this man refused to give, and the king, God himself, would not forgive him. If you have unforgiveness in your life, God will not forgive you. And if God has not forgiven you, then you're considered wicked in his eyes. And if you're considered wicked in his eyes, then his ears are closed to your prayers. And so... You say, but God is a loving, forgiving God. I'm sure even if I harbor unforgiveness in my heart that God will understand, he'll forgive me. I've been through a lot. But no, it's not true. God promises in his word that if you don't forgive, he will not forgive you. And he cannot go against his own word. So you need to ask for God to help you to forgive other people. I know some of us have gone through horrible, traumatic things. I've heard the stories. I understand where you're coming from. But God will strengthen you. Just call out to him and say, God, in my own ability, I cannot forgive them. But I want to forgive them. So God, help me. And you know what? God will answer you. He will help you forgive them, even if it takes a while. And you know what? He's a loving, kind, forgiving God. He will reach out to you. He will lift you out of your unforgiveness. And he will free you. And then he will rapidly turn around and he will bless you. Now, maybe it's not that you're walking in unrighteousness. Maybe you don't have unforgiveness in your heart, which brings me to reason number three. 
maybe the reason your answers are going, your prayers are going unanswered is because you've done something wrong to somebody and you need to make it right with them. To God, it's important that we make things right. He says before we go to the altar, before we offer our prayers and our gifts, that if we have something against somebody, we need to go reconcile, which means make things right with our fellow brethren. Right here it says, Matthew 5, 23 to 24. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother hath thought against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. A wonderful example of a man who did this in the Bible is Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was a tax collector. He was a publican and a sinner, and most likely he probably took more taxes than what was required of him, and he lined his own pockets. His fellow brethren had something against him. He was a thief, but everything changed when he encountered Jesus. In Luke 19, 1 to 10, it says, And Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, which was chief among the publicans, and he was rich. And he sought to see Jesus, who he was, and he couldn't for the press, because he was too little of stature. And he ran before, and he climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him, and he said, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must abide at thy house. And he made haste and came down and received him joyfully, and when they all saw it, they murmured, saying that he was gone to be guest with a man that is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have taken, any, taken anything wrong from man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. And Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation come to this house, for so much as he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. To our knowledge, before Zacchaeus even took a sin offering to the altar, because in that day in the Old Testament, men and women needed to take a sin offering to the altar, he promised Jesus that he would reconcile himself to his fellow brethren. Again he said, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. By returning the money he stole, he reconciled himself to his brothers, and he restored friendly relations with men who you can imagine would be very angry with him for stealing from them. And that is when Jesus said, This day is salvation come to this house. Is there anybody in your life that you need to make things right with? Somebody that maybe you've not told the truth, or you've treated wrong, or you've stolen from? In that case, you need to go and make it right to them. Jesus wants to bless you. He's eager to do so, but how can he if you've treated someone else wrong and not made it right? For example, are you asking God for finances and financial aid while you're stealing from him? You owe God 10% of your income, and if you don't give it to God, you're stealing from him. Automatically, you cannot expect for God to bless you if you are a thief. You need to repent and Give to God what belongs to him and reconcile yourself with your fellow brethren. And then God's ears will be open to your prayers. Here's the thing. In the movie Flywheel, which is a Christian film, which is very good, and you should go out and watch it if you haven't, there is a deceptive used car salesman who rips everybody off. The pastor comes into his used car salesman to buy a car for his daughter, and he rips him off by over $2,000. This man is deceptive, and he does not pay his 10% tithe. He puts empty envelopes into the offering when it comes time, so he doesn't look bad. And the meanwhile, the bank is about to repossess his business, because he is not being blessed. His marriage is falling apart. His little boy does not want to be anything like his father, and his conscience is eating away at him. Then one night, he has an encounter with God. He hears a preacher online preaching about getting right with God, and if you don't, then your whole life is going to go bad because God is the one who blesses us. He falls on his knees and he repents and says, God, please forgive me for all the evil I've done to people. And you know what? In the following few weeks, his business gets turned around. The day before the bank is supposed to come repossess all of his stuff, he sells out every car. And you know what? His marriage is healed. And his little boy finally says, I want to be like my dad. But here's the thing. 
he still had all those wrongdoings in his past, and he hadn't made it right yet. And his wife approached him the day after they had that big car sales day, and she said, shouldn't we make it right with the people who stole, you stole from? He says, I want to, but I owe them over $32,000. She hands him the bank statement, and it lines up with what they have after they pay off all their bills, and it lines up exactly, exactly with what he owes these people. He swallows his pride, he knocks on every single door, and he returns every last penny he stole. And if he had not done this, things would not have turned out well for him. You can, I won't, I won't actually give you spoilers, but if you watch the film, you'll see that if he had not closed that door on the devil's face, then the devil would have come in like a flood and God would not have been able to bless him. But because he made it right with his fellow brethren, God continued to abundantly bless him and his business, his marriage, and his family. So far, we've gone over three reasons your prayers may be unanswered. A lack of holiness, unforgiveness, and not making it right with your fellow brethren. But what if you're not doing those things and your prayers still aren't being answered? Well, the fourth reason is it may be a lack of fruit in your lives. Right here, I want you to picture something with me. Today is the day you've eagerly looked forward to all year. It's finally the season. You go out, you've been looking forward to apple pie and apple cake and apple ice cream and apple strudel and apple cinnamon and applesauce. And so you come out with your buckets and all of your ladders and you've worked hard on this tree. You have given it fertilizer, you've watered it, you've pruned it, you've even had specialists come in and take care of it. And when you get there, there is no fruit. You sigh in disappointment and you wonder, why did I put all this work into this tree when there is no fruit on it? You, me and Christian, we, okay, we, you as me and Christians, we are like fruit trees. Illustratively, in the word of God, Jesus calls us branches and he calls us trees. John 15, 5 says, I am the vine, ye are the branches, he that abideth in me and I in him, the saying bringeth forth much fruit, for without me ye can do nothing. As a branch, just like you with your apple tree, God wants us to bear much fruit. In fact, he's ordained or appointed us to bear much fruit. And when we don't bear fruit, just like you with your apple tree, God is disappointed in us. John 15, 16 says, Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that ye should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. Here you are, and you're a beautiful tree. You have lots of green foliage, your trunk is tall and strong, and to all appearances, you look like a good Christian. But the truth is, if you peer closely, there is no fruit in your life, and you haven't borne fruit for several years. You're just a lukewarm Christian. You're not hot, you're not cold, you're not evil, but you're not very good. You're just a tree with a lot of leaves and no fruit. I'm sure. God will be pleased with me anyway, right? I mean, at least I have green, verdant leaves and my trunk isn't rotten and it's not decaying. But remember, God has ordained you to bear fruit. And if you want your prayers answered, you need to bear fruit. Let's read John 15, 16 again. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you, that ye should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain that whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. Pay attention to that last part. There is condition to his promise that, to give us whatsoever we ask. And that condition or that requirement is to bring forth fruit and to keep bringing forth fruit. So the reason you may not be receiving an answer to prayer is a lack of fruit. Now before you get confused, I'm going to tell you what God considers fruit. He calls it the fruit of the Spirit. And in Galatians 5, 22 to 23, it says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. Think of a boy who enters the room and his little sister is toddling down the stairs. She tumbles, falls to the bottom of the stairs, and she starts wailing and crying. He shrugs his shoulders and says, It's not my fault she fell and he walks out of the room and into the kitchen. There the mom is, and she's seeing all of this. He waltzes up to her and says, can I have something good to eat, please? 
Do you think that she's pleased with his actions? Do you think she's going to eagerly hand over what he asked for? No, I didn't think so. Instead, she's most likely to scold him and tell him that his lack of love and his actions do not please her and he needs to make it right. If that little boy repents and says, I'm sorry, Mom, you're right, that was wrong of me, and he runs back into the room where his little sister fell, he picks her up, dusts off her knees, and hugs her, do you think then his parent is going to be pleased with him? I say yes, and when he goes back in and he asks her for help or asks her for aid, she'll eagerly hand it over to him. When that little boy originally walked past his sister, ignoring her hurt and her needs, he was showing a lack of fruit in his life. He was a tree with no fruit. Again, John 15, 5 to 8 says, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, ye can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered. And men gather them, and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If ye abide in me, and my word abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit. So shall ye be my disciples. According to these verses, if you are abiding in Christ and his words are abiding in you, then your prayers will be answered. And we can tell if you're abiding in him because if you are, you'll bear much fruit. In that little boy's first actions, there was no love, no gentleness, no goodness. To reiterate, there was no fruit in his tree. But he repented, he turned around, and he produced fruit, meat for repentance and then his requests were answered. On the other hand, imagine that after his mom had scolded him, he had shrugged his shoulders and said, I'm sorry, now can I have what I want? Would she have been pleased? Make sure that if there is a lack of fruit in your life, that you repent and then produce fruit, because God is not pleased with empty words and unfruitful actions. The Amplified Bible says in Matthew 3, 8, so produce fruit that is consistent with repentance, demonstrating new behavior that proves a change of heart and a conscious decision to turn away from sin. That is what that little boy did when he rushed to his sister's side and he helped her. He produced visible fruit. I want you to ask yourself, do I produce fruit? Can the people around me see my love, my joy, my peace, my long-suffering, my gentleness, my goodness, my faith, my meekness, and my temperance in how I act and what I do and what I say? Or am I just an empty tree with only leaves who is using up the soil, taking in the rain, basking in the sunlight, and producing no fruit? Because God does not like trees with no fruit. Luke 13, 6-9 says, He spake also this parable, a certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came and sought fruit thereon, and found none. Then said he unto the dresser of his vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and find none. Cut it down. Why cumbereth it the ground? And he answering said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also, till I shall dig about it and dung it, and if it bear fruit, well. And if not... Then after that, thou shalt cut it down. If you're not bearing fruit, then you're not pleasing God. And if you're not pleasing God, then how can you expect your prayers to be answered? Again, I say, if you want God to answer your prayers, then you need to bear fruit. You need to walk in holiness, forgive people, make your wrongdoings right with people, and you need to bear much fruit. And you need to walk by faith. The fifth reason your prayers may be going unanswered is you're failing to walk by faith. Hebrews 11:6 6 says, But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And Matthew 21, 21 to 22 says, Jesus answered and said unto them, Verily I say unto you, if ye have faith and doubt not, ye shall not only do this which is done to the fig tree, but also if ye shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, it shall be done. And all things whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing ye shall receive. Note the words, if ye have faith and doubt not, 
whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing ye shall receive. If you're not receiving an answer to prayer, it may be a lack of faith. But what is faith? How do you get it? And how do we show that we have faith? We'd be here all night if I fully delved into the topic of how we get faith and so on and so forth. But the Bible does give us a clue in Romans 10, 17 when it says, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So, according to Romans, hearing comes by the word of God. And faith comes by hearing, which means if you want faith, then you need to study, meditate, amuse, and consume the word of God. Put it in your heart. Find all the scriptures pertaining to faith. Find a book that is based on the Bible and read it. For example, Pastor Mike Yeager has a book called How Faith Comes, 28 Way That Faith Comes. And you can find that on the back shelf or online. And that's a good place to start. If you're confused, because many of us are, you can research it and ask God to help you. How do I develop faith in my life? But some of you are thinking, I do have faith, and I am walking by faith, but my prayers still aren't being answered. In that case, I want to challenge you then. I want you to ask yourself, how do I know that my faith is alive and not dead? Because if your faith is dead, it's not doing you any good. Paul says in James 2.17, even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. So if you don't have works, then your faith is dead. But I don't want you to think that I'm taking this verse out of context. So I'm going to go ahead and read the passage. James 2, 14 to 26 says, What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding ye give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? Even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe, and tremble. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest thou how faith wrought with works, and by works was faith made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. Ye see then that by works a man is justified, and not by faith only. Likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had received the messengers and had sent them out another way? For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. Thirty years ago, my dad went to build, build this building and God told him to order the steel for it. At the time, he did not have the money and he said, God, do you really want me to order it? I don't have the money right now. He says, go ahead and order it. Now, Dad could have said, you know what? I am going to wait till those finances come in before I order that steel. If he had done that, this building would not be here this day. Those finances would not have come in. And <laughs> he would have never gotten the money for the steel. So walking by faith required him to do something, to actually obey God and to move forward with ordering the steel. Ultimately, the rest of the money he needed came in on the very day the steel arrived. But I want to warn you, make sure you are hearing from God. Do not think that you're going to force the hands of God or that you're going to act like you have faith and do something because you're going to make yourself in a big heap of trouble. If Dad had not been hearing from God, he would have been sitting in jail. Now, however, if you know that God has called you to do something, if he's laid it on your heart and he's spoken through you to his word, it does not have to be a tangible voice from somebody else, if he says in his word to do it, then you need to do it because faith is required and God requires us to walk by faith before he answers our prayers and we show our faith by our works. Joshua and the people of Israel, they walked around Jericho again and again and again on the belief that God would knock down its walls. An older couple in this church who suffered from infertility they went home and they prepared a nursery when they heard that God was going to give them a child. 
The widow of Zarephath and her son, they prepared the last of their oil and the last of their bread and shared it with Elijah the prophet, believing his words that God would provide more. A man who suffered from cancer drank nothing but juiced fruits and vegetables, trusting that God had led him to do this in order to be healed. Naaman dipped himself seven times in the Jordan River after Elisha told him he would be cured of his leprosy by doing so. Every one of these people showed their faith by their works. And you know what? The walls of Jericho fell down. That older couple had a beautiful baby boy. That widow and her son, they had enough food and oil to last them the whole famine. And you know what? That man who drank nothing but juice, fruits, and vegetables was cured of his cancer. Naaman, when he dipped himself seven times, not six, seven times into that water, he arose leprosy-free because faith requires actions. Again, I must ask you, are you truly walking by faith? Sometimes that action is just waiting on the Lord. And you know what? And on his timing and actively just walking by faith and doing what he requires you to do in the meantime. But before I talk in depth about waiting on the Lord, I want to talk to you about the sixth reason your prayers may be unanswered. The first five reasons were a lack of holiness, unforgiveness, not making your wrongdoings right with your fellow brethren, a lack of fruit, and not walking by faith. Number six is wrong motives. Why are you asking what you're asking for? James 4, 2 to 3 says, Ye lust and have not, ye kill and desire to have, and cannot obtain, ye fight and war yet, ye have not, because ye ask not, ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lust. It could be that God isn't answering you because you're asking out of a wrong motive or, number seven, that what you want is against God's will. Search your heart and ask God to reveal if your prayer request is selfish or against his will. You may be asking for a husband or wife, but why are you asking? Are you looking for someone to fulfill you and make you complete? Because God is the only one who can do that. And he does not want you to look somewhere else for fulfillment and completion. Because not only will you be miserable, you will make that other person miserable. Is God against marriage? No, he's not against it. He created it. But he wants you to give the decision to him, to seek him, and to find your fulfillment on him and wait on him. The sad thing is, sometimes God, with a heavy heart, he will give us what we ask for even though it is against his will. And he knows that it will bring sorrow into our lives because we insist on it, we pursue it, we seek for it, we focus on it, and ultimately we pray, Father God, let my will be done, not yours. My dad has told this story so many times, so I'm certain he won't mind me using it as an illustration. Dad wanted to build a house away from the church in order to gain some privacy because we'd have people come knock on our door or even barge in in the middle of the night if we forgot to lock our doors. In Dad's direct words, I began to want to get away from the ministry's property. We had moved there a number of years before building a house right across the parking lot from the main facility. People were always coming and knocking on our door, not just asking for attention, but demanding it. With overseeing a large church and multiple other things going on, I began to feel burned out. So I began to search for a place where I could build another house away from it all. I discovered a plot of land that was for sale on the top of a mountain five miles from work. As I walked this land, the Spirit of God spoke to me in my heart and said, Do not buy this land. I went home and I told my wife what the Lord had said. You see, God does know best. But within a three-month period, every time I would drive past this land, I would stop and walk it while lusting after it. I kept asking the Lord for this land. A tragic day came when the Lord spoke to my heart with a sad voice. Go ahead and buy it. We had better be very careful about what we ask for because the Lord will give it to us if we are persistent. During this time, I had to stretch my schedule even more since I endeavored to build a gigantic geodesic dome home. In this time period, my little girl Naomi was born and troublemakers began to be manifested in the church. Eventually, Naomi ended up getting hurt and the church ended up splitting. Most of the hardships we go through, I believe, is not God's will for our lives. We oftentimes receive the backlash from our own poor decisions made as we listen to self and we shut out what the Spirit was telling us in the first place. 
that very morning at 3 a.m. when the Lord showed me how my disobedience and hardness of heart had opened the barn door to the enemy, I decided to kick him out and slam the door in his face then and there. That very morning, we moved out of the house. We went back to our original house that we had been living in. It is necessary at times in our life to find where we left the will of God, repent, and come running home like the prodigal son. Dad's decision resulted in a lot of heartache in his life and in our family's life. And the heartache he went through and we went through was the direct result of him asking and persisting for something was outside of God's will. You need to ask if what you want lines up with God's will. And if it doesn't, you need to toss it out. You need to throw it out. Now, before we move on, I want to make it clear that if you're praying for healing in your body, it is 100% God's will. I do not want you to walk out of this building and say, well, I've been praying for healing. She said maybe that it's out of God's will. And I've heard a lot of people say healing isn't for today. So, okay, it's not your will, God. It is God's will, all right? Now, there are so many scriptures in the Bible, and I had to choose just two. Jeremiah 30, 17 says, For I will restore health unto thee, and I will heal thee of thy wounds, saith the Lord. And you know Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. If he healed them yesterday, then he will heal them today, and he will heal them tomorrow. And he says, I am the Lord that changeth not. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not... Jacob are not consumed. And Isaiah 53, 5 says, But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. God already paid for your healing. And if it's not coming, then you need to ask God, God, am I lack faith? Do I have unforgiveness? God, what do I need to do? And you can also talk to Pastor Mike Yeager. He has wonderful stories and he has a good assortment of books that will help you develop your faith and accept and receive God's healing for you. So, if you're not receiving it, it's not because it's, not, it's against God's will to heal you. It is his will, period. So, to get back to our list, it could be that your motives are not wrong, and God is not against what you're asking for, even though it may be something like moving out of an old house or getting a newer vehicle. It could be purely that he is asking you to wait on his timing. Which brings us to reason number eight, not waiting on the Lord. Like I mentioned earlier, sometimes faith requires waiting. To use my dad for example again, he wanted a nicer motorcycle because him and mom, they like to go out and look at the beautiful scenery and take dinner dates and such, but the back seat was not very comfortable and mom couldn't stay on it very long. So he started looking and searching and he found he wanted a Harley Davidson Ultra Classic. And through his own efforts, on his own willpower, he found a black one for $10,000. He did not have the money for it. So he went to his eldest son, my oldest brother, Michael, and he asked him to borrow his credit card. <laughs> and so he took the credit card to the place with the motorcycle, and the credit card was denied. He went home that night, and he was lying in bed, and he heard God's voice say, Godliness with contentment is great gain. He knew God wanted him to put it in his hands, to not seek after the motorcycle, but to seek after God and just wait on the Lord. And you know what? God didn't say no. Several weeks later, he ended up with a white ultra classic, Harley Davidson. And he ended up getting it debt free. God is not against giving you something good. Just because you're asking God for something that may not be absolutely required for your daily living does not mean he's going to tell you no. But you need to look to the creator for fulfillment and not to the created. Just like in my dad's case, oftentimes God wants us to wait. Psalm 27, 14 says, Wait on the Lord, wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Isaiah 40, 31 says, But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. And Psalm 130, 5 says, I wait for the Lord, my soul doth wait, and in his word do I hope. God promised David he would be king. 
God promised Abraham that his offspring would be as the sands of the seashore and as the stars of the sky. God promised Moses he would deliver the people of Israel, and he promised he would send them the Messiah, Jesus Christ, to deliver them. With every one of these promises, these men had to wait on the Lord's timing. Just because God did not do it in a matter of moments did not mean that he wasn't going to fulfill his promises. And just because it doesn't seem like God is answering your prayers, it doesn't mean that he isn't currently working right now a miracle on your behalf. 2 Corinthians 5.7 says, For we walk by faith, not by sight. If you want an excellent example of this, I have a testimony to tell you, and that testimony is my own. For over eight years, my family and I lived in a tiny brown dome. And you know what? It used to be a food pantry, and my dad converted it into a house, so it was never in the best condition. But as time went on, this roof, this building, started leaking holes. The flat roof over the dining room leaked, chunks of it would fall in, and the dome itself would leak. And white plaster would fall on the ground every time it would rain, and it looked like bird poop. And you know what? Dad poured thousands of dollars trying to fix the dining room roof, trying to fix things, and things just would not be fixed. The only way we could do it is if we had a professional and a large chunk of money. And so we decided to join hands and thank God for a new roof. And so we thanked God for it. But meanwhile, the old house we had, we lost it to the bank because there was an older lady we were renting it to with lots of children. And she couldn't pay anymore after staying there for several years. And instead of kicking her out, we just let her stay as long as possible, and then the bank repossessed it. To all appearances, there was nothing going good. We lost our house, our own house was leaking, and it did not look good. So, but God was still working on our behalf in the background. A Christian man and his wife, they bought that old house that we lost to the bank, and they renovated it with the intent and purpose of flipping it. During this time, I kept thanking God for our new roof. And one night, I was kneeling in prayer. And I was thinking, where is our new roof? And I was thinking, do I need to join hands with my family and ask again? Because the Bible says, if two of you agree as touching anything on earth, it shall be done for you of my Father which is in heaven. So I was thinking that, and then I heard the still quiet voice. It's on its way, Steph. So I thanked God again for our new roof, and then I started thanking him for new insulation because the building was over 30 years old and it needed it. I thanked him for new windows because our windows, most of them were broken. I thanked him for a new front door because our, new, our front door was crumbling and falling apart and it let a lot of air in, especially during the winter. You know what, and while all this occurred, Mr. Whetstone, the Christian man who bought and renovated our old house, took close to three years to fix it. As I prayed for a new roof, he stuck a new roof on his house. As I prayed for new windows, he stuck in new windows. As I prayed for a new front door, he stuck in a new front door. And I said in one day in frustration to my family, I said, everything I'm praying for is going into that house. Where's ours? <laughs> and Michael and I, we joined hands and said, God, if you ever want us to move, we would like for them to plant fruit trees. The next day, they're out there planting a pear tree, an apple, t a pear tree, a peach tree, and a plum tree. And you know what? As he finished renovating this house, God made it clear he wanted us to buy it back. And this year, after eight years of living in the dome house, after three years of him renovating it, in the spring of 2018, we moved back into our old place, fully renovated from top to bottom, way better than we could have ever done. I really thought that God was just going to replace the roof on our little brown dome. So God answered us exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ask or think for. And since we didn't try to force God's hands and take things into our own matters, we were exceedingly blessed. Some of us, like Abraham with his first son Ishmael, try to take matters into our own hands, and it does not turn out right. We need to wait on God's timing and wait for our Isaac. So God answered my family's prayers. And during this whole time, he kept us in perfect peace. Yes, there was mold in our closets. Yes, everything stunk. Yes, in the dining room, there was mushrooms this tall growing out of the wall. But the one time I remember that it was literally raining in our dining room. And I laughed. Exactly. So, yes, and mom and dad, their roof was leaking on their bed upstairs. So if we had not had peace, if we had felt we need to get out of this house, we would have gotten out. God's peace kept us. 
So God answered our prayers, first and foremost, because he is so good and he is so gracious. Nothing we did deserved to have a brand new nice house. But also, because we did ask in faith, our motives were pure, we sought his will and not our own. We kept on saying, God, let your will be done. We do not want to buy back this place if it is not your will, because then we'll have a mountain of debt and you saying, I told you not to buy that. So we left it in God's hands. We kept on saying, Lord, let your will be done. And this is very important while we waited on the Lord. We thanked him for answering our prayers. We did not complain. Instead, we thanked him for the good things we had in our life. We thanked him that we actually had a roof over our head. It's not that we didn't have moments where we had to repent and say, God, please forgive me. It's not easy when you have mold in your closets and it's leaking everywhere and to all appearances, things are getting worse. But this is a big thing, being thankful. This is where many of us fail. And a lack of thankfulness is reason number nine. Let me just briefly mention the first eight reasons why our prayers may be going unanswered. A lack of holiness, unforgiveness, not making your wrongdoings right with your fellow brethren, a lack of fruit, not walking by faith, wrong motives, prayers that are against God's will, not waiting on the Lord, and a lack of thankfulness. God wants us to be thankful no matter what we are facing. And according to his words, he wants us to abound with thanksgiving. Colossians 2, 6-7 says, As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, as ye have been taught, abounding with thanksgiving. And 1 Thessalonians 5, 16-18 says, Rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Like this verse says, it is God's will for us to give thanks in everything. Now, note it says in everything, not for everything. You do not have to thank God for the mold growing in your closet. You do not have to thank God for your leaky roof, and you do not have to thank him for broken bones or for cancer. You find things to be thankful for, and you thank him in the midst of these circumstances. Are you saved? Thank him. Are you walking? Do you have two feet? Thank him. Is, and if you need your bill paid, thank him your bill is paid. Are you asking for healing? Thank him that you have received your healing. Do you need a miracle? Thank him that you have your miracle. Proverbs 18, 21 says, Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. If you thank him with your mouth and you speak life, you will eat the fruits thereof. It says, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. It doesn't say you may be. So if you're whining, you're complaining, and you're saying it's not happening, you'll eat that fruit, and you will not get anywhere. God tells us in Philippians 4, 6 to 7, Be careful for nothing but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known unto God, and the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So when you make your request, when you pray, make sure you thank him for what you already have, no matter how little it may be, and thank him for what he is about to do. Walk by faith, seek his will, wait on his timing, and be thankful in everything, and be diligent. Do not give up. People give up too quickly when they don't see something right away, and then they blame God and say, he just won't answer my prayers. This is reason number 10, a lack of diligence. As I read earlier in Hebrews 11:6, but without faith it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. He will reward you for diligently seeking him. I remember one night in the Brown Dome when we were living there that it was raining especially hard that night, and Mom had nailed a plastic sheet of white plastic to the wall to, in the bathroom to cover the hole there. And the rain caused the wall to crumble more and the plastic sheet fell down. Black, ugly, and extremely unattractive. When I saw that hole, it made me lose my joy and it made me lose my peace. And I started wondering, why isn't God providing? 
Where is he? And when I went down to lie down on my bed that night, I took up my meditations book, which is full of scriptures, and I heard the number 24 in my head. So I turned to page 24, and the scripture 2 Corinthians 5, 7 leapt out at me. It said, for we walk by faith, not by sight. God wanted me to disregard what my eye saw, the crumbling walls, the black mold, and instead be diligent with my faith and diligent with my thankfulness. Through faith, only through faith, I once again thanked him for our new roof. And as you know from earlier, God came through. Wait on his timing. Be thankful. Be diligent in your faith. And though it may or may not take years, God knows the right timing. He will come through. Abraham believed God's promise that his offspring would be as the sands of the shore and as the stars of the sky, even though his wife was infertile and she couldn't have children. And by the time she was 90 years old and he was 100, if Abraham can believe that God will come through with his promises, then most certainly we can believe in God when he says in Matthew 7, 7 to 8, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh, receiveth. And he that seeketh, findeth. And to him that knocketh, it shall be opened. And another verse that says, And this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions which we desired of him. And again, just to drive the point home, John 14, 12 to 14 says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. And greater works than he shall he do, because I go unto my Father. And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. Look at those last four words. I will do it. You have God's promise. You just need to take hold of that promise and diligently hold on to it. And by being diligent, you please God. So in the future, when you ask God for something and it's not happening, I want you to ponder these questions. Are you walking in holiness? Are you forgiving those people in your life? Are you making it right with people when you do them wrong, even if it's just yelling at them? Are you bearing fruit? Specifically, the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Are you walking by faith? Are you seeking God's will and making sure your, your motives are pure? Are you waiting on the Lord? Are you being thankful? And are you being diligent? But I can't possibly do all those things. It's impossible, you say. You're right. It is impossible. Without God. John 15, 5 says, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, ye can do nothing. But it says through Christ that we can do everything. Philippians 4, 13, it says, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. So hide your word in his heart. Have him abide in you and abide in him, and then you can do anything through him. He will strengthen you and enable you to do these things. And if you fall down and make mistakes, which we do, none of us are perfect before God. But if we strive to be perfect and we repent and we call upon him for help and deliverance, he will forgive, he will help, and he will deliver. And in seeking to do these things, you please God, and his ears will be open to your prayers. If you haven't noticed by now, there's a constant theme in these last 10 points that I went over. And you know what that is? That theme is pleasing God. Walking in holiness, it pleases him. Forgiving people pleases him. Making your wrongdoings right, it pleases him. Bearing much fruit pleases him. Walking by faith pleases him. Having pure motives and seeking his will pleases him. Waiting for his timing. Being thankful in the meantime. Being diligent in your faith pleases him. And ultimately, if you want God to answer your prayers, simply seek to please him. When you seek to please God with your actions, your words, your thoughts, your deeds, and your, your motives, and your prayer request, you can be certain that God will move on your behalf. The greatest example we have of this 
is Jesus Christ. In everything he did, he sought to please God. John 6.38 says, For I came down from heaven, not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. John 5.30, I can of mine own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father which hath sent me. John 4.34, Jesus saith unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. Matthew 26, 39 says, And he went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. By seeking and doing God's will, Jesus pleased his heavenly Father. Matthew 3, 17 says, And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. In pleasing God, Jesus' prayers, which lined up with God's perfect will, were always answered. And not only that, he cast out devils, he cleansed the lepers, he healed the sick, raised the dead, multiplied the fish and the bread, walked on water, calmed the stormy seas with his hands, instantly transported to other places, and he said in John 14, 12, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also, and greater works than these shall ye do, because I go unto my Father. Not only will our prayers be answered, but we will do greater works than Jesus Christ himself if we endeavor to please God in all we do. Don't settle for a fruitless, lukewarm life with a sporadic prayer answered here and there. Instead, set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ and God. And during it all, you need to trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not unto your own understandings. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct wreck thy paths. Seek the will of God, abide in his word, endeavor to please him in action, thought, word, and deed. And just like Jesus Christ and John and James and Peter and Smith Wigglesworth and Maria Worth Etter and all the old prophets and preachers of old, not only will God answer your prayers, he will show you the miraculous. Before we end in prayer, I'd like to sing a song that God has given me and it's called, I Require. Lord, do you hear my cries? Lord, do you hear my prayers? Are you even there? Oh, Lord, do you even care? Constantly I'm asking, ceaselessly I'm praying, hoping for you to answer me. Oh, Lord, what do you require of me? I require holiness, forgiveness, to do justly and to love mercy. I created you to bear much fruit, to walk by faith and to always do what pleases me, what pleases me. Search your heart and ask my will. Wait on me and be thankful. Be diligent and you will see. I will answer your every plea. I'll show you great and mighty things. All I ask is that you do what pleases me. My child, I hear your cries. I hear your every prayer. I am always there, and yes, I do care. Keep on asking and praying, keep on believing and trusting, for I will surely answer you, and this is all I require of you. I require holiness, forgiveness, to do justly and to love mercy. I created you to bear much fruit, to walk by faith and to always do what pleases me, what pleases me. Search your heart and ask my will. Wait on me and be thankful. Be diligent and you will see. I will answer your every plea. I'll show you great and mighty things. All I ask is that you do what pleases me. Wait 
upon the Lord. Stand firm in faith and see, like Moses in the desert, I will split the sea. Though the promise tarry, yet it will come. Set aside your doubts and worries, for I have overcome, and I have just begun. I require holiness, forgiveness, to do justly and to love mercy. I created you to bear much fruit, to walk by faith and to always do what pleases me, what pleases me. Love the Lord with all your heart and from my ways do not depart. Be diligent and you will see I will answer your every plea. I'll show you great and mighty things. All I ask is that you do what pleases me. Yes, all I ask is that you trust and you believe. This is what I require of thee. Let's end in prayer. Father God, I thank you for the word that you've given today, and I ask that you soften our hearts and you reveal your truth to us, Father God. Cleanse us from secret faults and help us to walk in holiness as you are, in, as you are holy. Help us to abide in faith and abide in you and hide your word in our heart and meditate on you and wait on your timing. Help us to become more like you to where everything we do in word, action, thought, and deed pleases you, Jesus. Change our hearts and lead us in the path of righteousness for your name's sake. And Lord, this is what I ask in Jesus' name, that you quicken this word to our hearts and you help us to move and act on it. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.